So it's a real honor for me um, to chair this panel and to see how far the idea of temporary structures has evolved for this APT. It initially began as an exploration into the idea of vertical ephemerals. Behind us is the ephemeral island home reef in Tonga, which has emerged sporadically in 1852, 1857, 1984, and most recently in 2006, with its last eruption producing pumice rafts that floated all the way to Fiji, Vanuatu, Australia, and Papua New Guinea. This evocation, this evocative propulsion of energy with such a wide ranging reach, was an initial and apt metaphor for the creativity and originality of a particular form of contemporary Pacific art. I was particularly interested in the physical manifestation of Pacific people's propensity to create vertical and ephemeral structures like the Pentecost land diving towers, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Along with my colleague Ruth McDougall, curator of Pacific art, we began to look at vertical ephemeral structures throughout the Pacific, including New Zealand. Joanna Langford's work, also included in this APT, was one of the inspirations for this idea as well. Ephemeral or temporary structures as an idea now sings in the long gallery here at Goma with the two spirit houses and the mesmerizing performance objects. And I'd particularly like to acknowledge Ruth McDougall, Michael O'Sullivan, and their co-curator, Martin Fowler, who's here with us. Also part of this idea is Richard Malloy's Big Yellow. Sorry, so that's my acknowledgement of these two magnificent structures with which Andrew will talk a little bit more, particularly about the Abalam one. And also part of this idea, as I was saying, is Richard Malloy's Big Yellow and Joanna Langford's Crawl Space. And they're both in this building. And this is just for the Pacific. As we will hear today, there are many other artists throughout the APT whose work also happens to converse with this idea. So without further ado, I'd like to now introduce Paul Mehmet, who is Professor at the School of Architecture and Institute for Social Science Research and Director, Aboriginal Environment Research Centre at the University of Queensland. Paul Mehmet is also an architect and an anthropologist with over 30 years experience in the field of Indigenous person-environment relations. He's a principal of the Brisbane-based consulting firm Paul Mehmet and Associates. This firm specialises in, con in consulting on Aboriginal projects and has a long track record of involvement in Aboriginal housing practice and research. Paul Mehmet is the author, author of six books, including Ganya, Gundi and Wurli, The Aboriginal Architecture of Australia 2007, which won several national book prizes, including the Stanner Prize of the Australian Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. So I'll leave it over to you, Paul, and I'll pass you the clicker. Thank you, and um, good morning and welcome, everybody. And I, too, would like to pay my respects to the traditional owner groups of southeast Queensland. And I'm going to call the names of some of the groups. Um, to the north, the Durbal. To the south, the Yagara and Jagara. To the southwest, towards Boona and Bow Desert, the Yugarabal. At the Gold Coast, the Yugambir and the Combamere. In Moreton Bay, called Kwandamuka, we have the Nunakal, Ngugi and Gurunpul groups. And to the north, in around the Glasshouse Mountains and up to the Sunshine Coast, we have the Undambi, Jinnabara and Kabikabi peoples. I'm calling the names of these groups because I'm here this morning wanting to talk about Aboriginal places and cultural landscapes. So I would ask you to consider your position in the cultural landscape here today and perhaps reflect about the cultural landscapes from where you ca come yourselves. I'm interested in the structures of place. Um, there are al alternate possibilities of such landscapes, being either temporary, ephemeral and lost, or being a permanent part of Australian <laughs> urban cultures and retained, or be a transformed. And we could also substitute Asian and Pacific urban cultures as well. Um, sorry, I'm forgetting to <laughs> show some of my slides. Um, <clears throat> I was asked to speak partly because of interest in my book, Ganya Gundi and Worley, The Architecture of Aboriginal Australia. Uh, 
in, 19, in 1770, when Captain Cook um, sailed up the east coast of Australia, he missed the permanent villages of the more sedentary groups which I've described in this book. For example, the stone houses of the Gunijmara people in Western Victoria. Um, he only saw more temporary shelters and camps and saw them as being ephemeral structures and concluded that there was no, there was no architecture, no settlement, no land tenure, no governance, no need for a treaty. Um, he took the country in the name of, of um, Britain with, without forming a treaty, as he did in, as, as what happened in New Zealand, for example. However, what was certainly in existence um, was Aboriginal land tenure and geography. And one of the first anthropologists to understand this Aboriginal science was Donald Thompson, who began work in Cape York in the late 1920s. He wrote a famous paper called The Seasonal Factor in Human Culture, illustrated from the life of a contemporary nomadic group, which was concerned with the Wikmunkan people. And um, I'm sorry you can't read that there, but I've set out the headings on this, um, on this um, particular table of his, which show the five um, seasons down the left-hand side of the Wick Munken, um, the types of uh, shelters that they built. There were a repertoire of seasonal shelters, um, and they were used at particular sites in the landscape which were chosen specifically to obtain particular types of food and um, plant items and um, particular sorts of technologies were used. So this was, this is, this was the pattern of uh, movement through the country and exploitation, the traditional economic patterns. This country wasn't mapped until the 1970s uh, by Peter Sutton and Athol Chase. But this map is in the Wick country um, near Cape Kierweer, which had been named by the Dutch in the 1600s. And you, again, at the details too fine to see, but the map shows the different clan territories, um, the estates, and also there are symbols for wet season camps, early dry camps, mid dry camps, late dry camps, and first rain camps as people move through their landscapes. Meanwhile, I was studying uh, at the same time in, in the Wellesley Islands, including Mornington Island, the lardal properties of place for my PhD. And I found there that lardal people's shelters were seasonal and temporary. Memories were seldom retained of specific shelters, only of places and relevant technology skills. So this was some of my mapping that I was doing. Place identity remained permanent in people's minds while they continued to visit and debate country. The structure of mental maps was very important. Um, part of the geography is sacred sites. And on this map there's a, um, uh, a stonefish sacred site, uh, a wild bee sacred site, a flood making sacred site, a wallaby sacred site and a bluefish sacred site. Uh, this is the Wallaby sacred site. In my career, I've been fortunate to be trusted to record many sacred sites in cultural landscapes, places where there's a religious belief that there remain perpetual recreative energies in the landscape. In this belief system, these places still exist even in metropolitan settings such as Brisbane, whether people know about them or not. But how much knowledge of these traditional places remains in the metropolitan places? Here we sit at Kurilpa, the place of the rat, the place of Kuril. The, sa the Kuril sacred site is not far from us, just over here on the bank of the river. So we are still surrounded by sacred sites in Brisbane. Some of this knowledge can be retrieved from historical research. For example, John Steele's Aboriginal Pathways a version of this map is on the window in the Queensland Library. But also from oral history. Uh, a friend of mine, brother Alex Bond, a cubby cubby man, is a contemporary Aboriginal geographer and this is his DVD, Songlines into Brisbane, with his great great grandfather Fred Embry, chief of the cubby cubby tribe. Aboriginal placemaking and craft maintenance can be a form of contemporary Aboriginal economy, what 
and specifically hybrid economies. Hybrid economies are when groups have to uh, carry out multiple different economic practices to obtain a living. Here men of the Jidabal, Gungai and Girawai groups at the Murray River in, um, up in the rainforest country near Tully are revitalising rainforest dome construction for cultural tourism enterprise, the late Jack Muriata. And here at Camerweel on the Queensland border with the Northern Territory, <coughs> Aboriginal trainees at the Mayuma Dakalunji camp are helping with a study of the properties of spinifex grass as part of University of Queensland research on the potential economic prospects of spinifex fibres and resin in modern economy. And we're fortunate to have um, Shirley McNamara here today with her her spinifex artwork in the exhibition, um, her fibre, her fibre sculptures. So she was from this collaborative group as well that we work with, trying to um, develop a way of uh, revitalising traditional skills for modern economies. When I was young in the 1970s, I noted that Aboriginal stone arrangements, sacred stone arrangement sites, that were classified by government as cultural heritage were very similar to the new conceptual art sculpture. And Tiffany's here's just reminded me that this particular slide out of Studio International Journal it features Richard Long, a sculptor who was making very similar stone arrangements as to what I was recording as religious sites. And we find today that since the 1970s these distinctions between modern art and Aboriginal placemaking and maintenance have largely broken down and have been erod eroded and are forming cultural expressions in, in contemporary architecture and art. Aboriginal places, or this is an example of um, sacred stone arrangements on the, on the um, Darling River, believed to be created by, by army, um, a religious um, figurehead. Aboriginal places in urban areas are not necessarily ephemeral. Mental constructs of place remain and are transmitted. Individuals in groups are actively maintaining them and some as part of their hybrid economies. I think I'll leave it there, Maud, because um, I've tried to throw up some ideas and people want to ask me questions about some of these ideas. Mm, I think that's very interesting what you've brought to the table. There is, a, there is a, a definition in my book on Aboriginal minimalist architecture and I can talk about that if someone wants me to. Sure, that would be so fantastic. I'll pass thank on. You better Paul. to hear someone else talking. That's fine. So our next, thank you, Paul. So our next speaker is Dr. Andrew Motu. Dr. Andrew Motu is director of the Papua New Guinea National Museum and Art Gallery in Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea. He's an Arapesh man from the East Sepik River, province of Papua New Guinea. He was educated at, at the University of Papua New Guinea in Port Moresby and completed his master's and PhD in social anthropology at the University of Cambridge. For his PhD, he carried out field research in Kan Kanganamun, village on the Sepik River, river, during which time he was also inducted into the men's initiation cult there. He has written Paired Brothers, Concealment and Revelation, yet more ritual art from the Sepik, Papua New Guinea with Anita Hurl, and names are thicker than blood, kinship and ownership amongst the yet more Oxford University Press 2009. So without further ado, I'll pass on to you, Andrew. So that's the book that you referred to hasn't yet come out. Oh, okay, well that's, that's good to say. <laughs> Look out for it. <gasps> um, Thank you to uh, uh, Kwagoma for hosting us and for bringing us, all of us here together, and especially also to uh, the Queensland government for hosting us. And of course, uh, I think the, the rituals of acknowledging our traditional land owners have already been uh, well rehearsed. Uh, thank you to, um, especially to the uh, sponsors of the Papua New Guinea contingent, uh, Mr. Kramer. Uh, thank you for supporting the Papua New Guinea artists for uh, coming here, staying in Brisbane and be part of this APT uh, Centennial. Um, it's a very moving description of ephemeral structures from uh, 
our uh, first speaker. Um, I, I think of two, two I'll, I'll just describe two, two kinds of ethnographic scenarios in Papua New Guinea to uh, think with this idea of temporal structures. And one is the famous Malangan sculptures. Uh, we had talks about it yesterday from uh, Professor uh, Kushla in our keynote uh, in the afternoon. Um, but these are ceremonial funerary uh, objects uh, designed to sort of house the uh, uh, ancestral agency, people who are being commemorated for uh, whatever they have achieved over life, and they are now trying to be turned into ancestors, and so they make this uh, ceremonial effigies, if you like, that provide for them a momentary uh, place to keep their presence. And then uh, they are sort of exhibited. I mean, these are really fine. I mean, you, you will see a good number of them in overseas museums. And they, uh, you know, they contain images of different kinds of birds and animals and, uh, uh, and so on. And they are well decorated, painted mostly with black, uh, white, and red, yellowish uh, kind of uh, dyes. And they, after, 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 uh, after being exhibited for a very short time, maybe a few hours, even some minutes, maybe perhaps 30 minutes or so, then they're put into fires and decimated. Uh, somehow they captured the interest of uh, museums overseas, and they found their ways into um, they found their ways into overseas museums uh, for the last 200 years or so. Uh, but in, in 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 the village where they are, uh, in the places where they are originally uh, made, um, they are supremely ephemeral, and they people just simply. Uh, acquired the rights to reproduce the images, uh, perhaps 30 years later. And they sort of used magic and they used dreams and all kinds of techniques to sort of retrieve memories of these images that are uh, embedded in people's memories. So they basically transect in images that are lodged in people's memories after these images are, uh, after these figures are decimated in fire. Um, um, the other one is the, the one out there in the village. Uh, uh, it's called um, uh, Korombo in the Abelam language. Now, it's not a man's house, it's a spirit house. And it's occupied by a, a particular kind of spirit beings, they call them Gwaldo. Uh, Gwaldo is also the word for grandfathers, and do is the word for people or men. So like spirit fathers or something, they, uh, they preside over these you know, really powerful structures, and they instruct people in all kinds of things, uh, so to speak, in their religious belief. Um, <coughs> Next to um, a Korombo would be uh, what would be called a Wapenge. A Wapenge is, uh, it's where the, where the, it's like a little man's house. It's like a little man's house where mostly elderly people, elderly men who at the time, just before the initiation is held, um, they basically feed them yams, and if you eat yams, you become an, an ancestor. So I spent like three weeks in this village where this particular man's house comes from, in Apangai. And Apangai is also um, um, an ancestral home to the Abelam people, in as far as this particular kind of ceremonial art is concerned, and in as far as this particular kind of ritual is concerned. Apa is their word for bones, and guys, the word for village. So it's the bone village 
of the original Yemen mm -hmm. and to somehow find its way into uh, the Abelam culture. Um, <coughs> I was, I was uh, uh, walking up to this village not far from uh, uh, near town, uh, a little bit far away locally from where this, this particular uh, uh, ceremonial uh, house comes from. And uh, I saw, uh, you know, they, they cultivate yams, uh, uh, tubulars, and they, they built up this yam house like this. And I said, hey, the, the shape of this the, the yam vines sort of spiral up, uh, so they have to put down supports, plant support sticks, so that the vines could uh, uh, crawl up. And in so doing, you will encourage the growth of the yams. Um, but I said, the, the, the shape of the uh, yam house looks like the shape of the crumbo. And they said, yeah, you're right. Uh, they are called wapinge as well. So it's, then I realized that um, these um, <coughs> the head of the yam and the tail of the yam uh, sort of organizes uh, the entire architecture. Uh, and inside, you, in the substance of the yam, you have spirit beings and all kinds of things that are sort of contained within um, this sort of organistic uh, imagery of uh, culture. And you find the entire ceremonial ritual stretched out between heads and tails, uh, just like we have crocodile heads and crocodile tails down on the Pacific River. Uh, but this one is somehow botanically inspired by yams. And so uh, this is a kind of vegetational metaphor transformed into architecture. Um, but on the day when, on the day when, on the day when a ceremonial is uh, sort of stage in the village, you find all kinds of things constantly in the making. One of them is the singing. There's a lot of fire, and there's a lot of heat in the afternoon, and then suddenly it grows cold by the night. There's a lot of smell on, uh, on uh, you feel like the perfumes that are worn on adornments and uh, decorations and so on. And they sort of last for uh, the length of the night and then uh, by the morning they possibly will have lost themselves in your sort of olfactory senses and just kept in your nostrils or somewhere. Um, uh, so I, 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 I'm moving from, I mean, he was describing a different kind of architectural setting and you find um, a kind of uh, a social form of this architecture being then ritually expressed in the organization of uh, ritual behavior. Again, I mean, Susan Kusla was referring to the social form of art and uh, the yesterday, and this this is how it takes in in in, in, in this particular kind of uh, building. Um, you have the facade, and it's you know this uh, it's has mythological sort of. Uh, implications, I mean, some of them might be able to tell you what it means, but it's basically to instill fear, awe, and admiration, and you find a lot of uh, string bags there, uh, sort of providing a kind of cultural template for people to innovate upon making their billums or string bags and so on. Um, and then once the ritual is over, uh, they don't go and stay inside this house again. And um, uh, in fact, the, the carvings that are painted uh, possibly will not be painted again for some time. And you require a group of artists who know how to paint and you, a group of artists who know uh, how to carve. And if you don't have artists, then you won't have the ritual. So uh, I mean, one of the great things of this initiative is that you've uh, put value into a village in Papua New Guinea, well, they will go back and train young people to work. In 2004, for instance, we uh, sort of attracted controversy. The Papua New Guinea National Museum attracted controversy by allowing <coughs> one of these, from this village, Apangai, to come to Melbourne because of the interest of an art dealer who wanted to purchase this uh, uh, ceremonial house. So. Um, 
I was sent there to look at uh, what local people possibly think about it. And uh, after three weeks, I went back to Mosby and I said, yeah, we can allow this building to go to Australia. And uh, somehow uh, uh, the SBS television network got wind of it and came around and did a documentary of this process of you know, demolishing the house and you know, packing it into vehicles and taking it down to Wewek for shipment to Australia. And uh, they said, what the hell is wrong with the National Museum in Mosby and giving permission to some Australians to ship this building to Australia? And I said, no. Um, um, the museum was forced to explain to the public and to the Prime Minister and the government what was happening. But we, we based our decision b both on law and on ethnographic realities. And we thought that by allowing uh, an external interest to uh, 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 export this uh, artifact, we will a house, we will uh, continue to spare uh, initiatives to uh, build new houses in future. And certainly, this is an example of uh, uh, allowing that kind of uh, making that kind of decision. And you still have a sort of uh, generation of artists who are still able to make this house, still able to paint and carve and so on. But this is just a commentary on what happened <laughs> with regards to this man's house. Anyway, I'll, I'll pause here. Thank you very much, Andrew. I think that that's a very interesting point for us. One of the most interesting things about working with these two spirit houses was that we worked extensively with the artists in Papua New Guinea. And then we, were also, we also brought these artists out to stay in Brisbane and to build these structures. And that's what was interesting is seeing their translation once they had seen the actual building where these houses would be held, that they actually were very, very much part of those decisions of how those houses would be shown. So that for the Cuomo house, the flipping of the roof up was an idea of how to visually show those patterns even more in terms of them being in an art gallery. So for us, we really loved working with them at that level in terms of that cre creative input. So again, part of your work to have started that and then those conversations to go in different ways. Um, now, which is great. Thank you. I, f I forgot to add that uh, inside, a, inside a house, there are all kinds of figures kept in there. These are the secret things mm -hmm. that the initiates go in. And uh, I think part of the, the sort of the, the quintessential aspect of the ritual is uh, getting visual access to the spirits in there. And the spirits are sort of instantiated or uh, objectified in these carvings that are kept in there. And after the, after the initiation is over, uh, some of them are kept very secret in different chambers inside. Uh, but most are then taken to the back of the uh, house, like the tail of the house, and they're kept there, and they're supposed to be just left, and they disintegrate into the, into the soil. Mm, okay. And uh, if you bend them like you bend the uh, New Island or Malangan figures, then the belief is that you will trace yam gardens. Okay. So bending the figures is bending the garden, so mm. you, 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 can't, you can't set a light a garden. Right. Uh, so somehow they, they, this, this house is uh, intrinsically connected with uh, some ideas about you know, the fertility of gardens mm. and uh, of cult cult yam mm. cultivation. Yes, mm. no, I found that metaphor that you spoke about very interesting in terms of the yam. Mm. Mm, I hadn't realised that. That's a good, it's a good thing to think about. Thank you. <laughs> now from the Pacific to Asia, as I said, there was, there's a lot of conversations happening on these same themes that um, we're now exploring and looking at. So um, Fuan Tai Meng and Tiffany Chung are going to talk about some ideas in their work. Um, and we'll start with Tai Meng. Tai Meng, I'll just give a little bit of an intro to you. You live and work in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. His photorealist paintings depict the in-between spaces of cities, created, creating unsettling representations of urban life. His work for APD7 shows an array of freeway overpasses and slip roads in Kuala Lumpur. And by cutting the surface of his canvases, Tai Meng draws on an analogy between the role of illusion in painting and the fallibility of civic ambitions. 
Taiming has exhibited widely in Asia as well as in the UK and in the Havana Biennale in Cuba in, Cuba in, in 2006. His work in APT is titled The Luring of, and I'm sure you might explain a little bit more about the rest of the characters, and it's in the Queensland Art Gallery collection and it's located on level three of this building if you want to go and have a look. I'll let you speak. I'm going to be very straightforward <laughs> to, to talk about my work, yeah, my, my study. Uh, my work is more about the relationship of the people, the living space and the social landscape. I think uh, that is what I'm interested in, like, explore things. So, Uh, I started, uh, this series of work is uh, from a few years ago, like 2004, and I started to, to study of the people, the working class people every day. So how uh, they are very like of things. I think that that is a, a reason that uh, is make me go for that direction is because of uh, when I'm teenage time is like quite uh, weird that because uh, I'm growing up in the south of the Malaysia is which is quite near to Singapore so uh, there's a lot of influence from the Singapore for me myself so and I totally. Uh, not understand about my own country, so it's, uh, yeah, after 20 years, so one day I suddenly I feel that, yeah, I need to start to do something for myself. Yeah. This is a uh, solution of living. So for me it's quite uh, funny. Every, every, every family in their houses, they, they will have uh, this kind of water filter. So it's something great for me because it's like water for, for, for us is like it's a, it's a need of living. Yeah. But how come we, we can't get a, like a really healthy or really good quality of water supply so but it become a habit become a very natural things that we need a uh, water filter <laughs> yeah and we love like advertising of different type of water filter so it become it become uh Great for me, but it looked natural for everybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. This is not, This is a case of uh, I, I, I myself I experienced the, the issue because of uh, there's a conflict with within the government, the water supply company, and the residency. So they cut off the, the water. So it's end up like the, resi the residents, like it's end up a solution to join it back with a different way. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a kind of, yeah, maybe a temporary structure. <laughs> So it's a, it shows that uh, a different position within that when you, you stand in a different position, actually the, the temporary and the structures, it means difference. And it, it may be a, a kind of strategy, I think, for the structure and the same. temporary.
So in, in, in Malaysia, we, yeah, we, I think we, for the past 10 and 20 years, we developed quite fast, I think. We have a lot of big projects, uh, and we have a lot of budget projects as well. So, yeah, it become a monument of everywhere we can find. It's, it's, it's just like a sculpture or installation. Yeah. So I think that that is is try to is make me think of uh, what actually is happened with all these kind of things. Mm. Is that any attitude? I think is the attitude kind of things or any like thing of professional or yeah or just a. Uh, strategy of surviving. So, <coughs> yeah. So the world is turned out and try to uh, create a world that to reflect that kind of situation. So I start playing, yeah, with the painting, kind of material, canvas, stretches, colors. Try to try try to look for uh, try to try to express try to bring out uh, what actually behind behind the scene the story that we heard we saw at the back actually what what is actually happening right? I think if there is a attitude of like uh, seeking the truth or seeking the story behind the scene. Yeah, for, for the piece of the painting, like I mean, for the APT, the, yeah, one of uh, one of the reasons that I'm cutting the canvas is because I think it's it's the nature of the cam of a painting that you will show something really solid, beautiful, mm -hmm. and so I'm trying playing with, with the character of the painting. So, like after you're cutting out. It turned back to the uh, the natural character of the mm -hmm. canvas. It's a soft. Uh, it's totally have a contrast within the original character and the, the character that the artist project. Yeah. So I I'm try try to playing with that kind of idea to show that whether the uh, urbanization development. Uh, is what we saw or is something that we already misreading of that. Yeah. So I just try try to use a quite simple material of like the paintings, uh, material structures, canvas, colors, try to, try to uh, bring up that kind of question I think. I think for myself as well. Mm. And the cutting action for me is uh, some people are asking me whether you are trying to attack, mm -hmm. <laughs> try to attack the issue, try to attack the canvas. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, it's not. For me, it's like it's action of now attitude of looking the truth, looking beyond what we saw. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, it's more to yeah in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Try try to look for the story to the behind the, mm -hmm. the what we saw. So mm -hmm. it's actually it's like. Maybe we, we, we can't just always believe on what we heard, mm. <laughs> we saw. Mm. Yeah, we are always need to like think twice. Mm. Yeah, think twice. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's in my ma in my artistic approach. Yeah, I try to bring not within just the uh, images of the face, even the tag titles of the world. Uh, yeah, try to like. Okay, I just talk about the the title. Okay, the title of the work for the IPT is uh, it's the Chinese. which is not a translation. It's I'm trying to playing with both language. So actually, it's 
try to bring up. Uh, when you look at the English, you, you only like understand like fifty percent. So it's it's like an issue that when you look at the issue, maybe you just understand like fifty percent or even thirty percent. So what actually, uh, if you want to know the full story, maybe you need to do something. Maybe you need to just translate or ask mm. friends or what. So you need to do something from that. Mm. Yeah, so I'm not going to explain the okay. words. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mm. Okay, this uh, you can sorry. Let's just go. Beautiful structures that we have. Physical structures, human structures. Is this true? Yeah, this is okay. This is some reference of other work of mine for the past few years. Permanent and fragile. Yeah. So it's made with those uh, construction safety net and the way of construct is actually is very simple. I try to use a very temporary way. I just tie it with the cable tie. So it's a really temporary <laughs> kind of method of building the house. Mm. Uh, around ten feet house. Mm. Uh, this is the beauty of my house. Another star. <laughs> <laughs> it's really beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Timing. I thought that was really interesting, the idea of uncovering. You said it was a survival, a strategy of survival in terms of how you started and the way that you're approaching. And I really like that idea of that the canvas is as it seems, but when you, when you cut it, you're seeing another layer. And it's something that's kind of also happening in some of the other structures. And Richard Malloy's, for example, is very much like that. You see it as a and you start, you see it as a sculpture, but then when you go on the inside, you can actually also see its structure, so it reveals itself as you engage with it. And that's a very interesting yeah, idea. For the structure from a different way. Yes, <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> right. Yeah, no, no, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker is Tiffany Chung. Um, her incisive perspective on contemporary culture has been brought to bear on photography, sculpture, installation, and performance. Her interests are guided by a synthesis of playful ideas and critical observations of the changing cultural and socioeconomic landscape of Vietnam. Touching on perceptions of migration, evolution, and progress, they raise questions of the relationships of humans to an environment, be it artificial or natural, in perpetual transition. Tiffany has exhibited widely throughout Asia and also in Europe and the US as well as working with the Campbelltown Art Centre in 2010. She has two artworks in this APT, one on the third level of this building titled Roaming with Dawn, Snow Drifts, Rain Falls, Desert, Wind Blows, and a kids' APT project called One Day the Bird Flies Across the Sea, which has been supported by the Tim Fairfax Family Foundation. And this work is also located on level three of this building. Tiffany. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me here. Um, so this is the work that you can see upstairs on the third floor. And I'm going to just flip through um, the picture so you would have an idea. Or well, this is for the children. 
Can I have the light back on, please? I'm sorry. Um, so, in the past six years, um, I have my work has uh, been concerned with conflict, migration, progress, transformation, and environmental degradation. Um, I'm Vietnamese American, going back to live in. V I mean, I'm living in Vietnam now and um, just experiencing rapid transformation um, in terms of urban development and also cultural transformation um, has made me um, want to understand more about um, what's going on, not just in Vietnam, but in order to understand what's going on in Vietnam, I have started looking at neighboring countries and um, also at other post-industrial countries like America. So in the past six years, I spent um, a lot of time studying about Japan's modern history, especially um, its rapid post-war development. And um, so I will be um, showing you um, some of the clips from a film that I've been working on it's not uh, completely finished, but it's based on my research on uh, various transformation processes of towns and cities in um, Mine City, Yamaguchi Prefecture in Japan. Can I have the light back on, please? Thank you. So um, with this film, I spent a year and a half um, looking at the decline of small agricultural and industrial towns in this um, one particular area in Japan. And um, this, this film started with Akiyoshirai, is the largest plateau in Japan. And since, like, uh, as you have just listened to what the man spoke in and read the subtitles, um, since the very beginning of time, human has already intervened with the landscape for survival reasons. Um, so however, as we're progressing, um, I think it's no longer about just survival. So I'm gonna um, continue showing. Oh, sorry. みんなそのだったのに彼女も宝石工場で働きに彼女も宝石工場で働きに彼女も宝石工場で働きに彼女も宝石工場で働きに彼女も宝石工場で働きに彼女も宝石工場で働きに彼女も宝石工場で働きに
くまで彼女は時々どうせき彼女をでも記憶に苦しむ。I will fast forward to just the slide. So, can I have the light back on? Thank you.、Um, so, this film, like,、um, just like other works of mine, it explores the industrialization, demographic changes,、um, natural disaster, extreme climate impact, and human destruction. So, I'm looking at、um, this town. And if you see, this is like、um, a small, very small Edo town. And Ube Cement is a very big company、um, in Japan.、Uh, and they built a factory in this town in the 1950, 1953, I believe. And、um, so when I came to the town to do my research,、um, it looks like a ghost town because it looked like it was covered in this layer of dust.、Mm. And I didn't really understand whether people were still living there because you didn't really see、uh, a whole lot of people wandering on the road.、Uh, and it looks like it has been forgotten for so long. But you know, the more time I spent there, the more I realized the town was just covered in this layer of cement dust、mm-hmm. um, every winter. So at the in the winter, the wind blows towards the direction of the town, and、um, that's how it gets covered in. Layers and layers of cement dust.、Mm. And I also, I was、um, also interested in tracing all these、uh, defunct coal mines in the same area. So I,、um, when we went to different coal mines, and in the film it also shows all these different coal mines, and we interview ex coal miners, and、um, they were telling us about the decline of the town. Um, how it was once very、uh, blooming town, and after all the coal mines got shut down in the 1970s and 1980s,、um, the population has declined、uh, sharply. So we go,、uh, we've done research, I, I, with my research team in Japan, we've gone to all these little villages and talking to people and just like. They'll be in participant observation for a year and a half.、Mm-hmm. So you will see houses like this. And I think it's not just Japan, but I, to my understanding, that、um, this kind of critical decline is what has been happening、um, all over the world, but Japan is just a major case.、Mm-hmm. So, this is、um, the ending of my film with this shot. All right, and、um, the second part of my research was、um, the focus on the, the decline of、um, an extensive flatland region called the Great Plains in the US.、Um, I focused on the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. Which exemplifies the resulting effects of climate variability interacted with human activity. With the misuse of land, inappropriate agricultural practices, and extreme climate impact, the 1930s severe dust storms destroyed 25 million hectares of land and caused 300,000 people m i g r a t e d west during the Great Depression. And、um, this one, well, I hope,、uh, I don't know how many of you、uh, have seen pictures of the、uh, Galapagos giant torsters.、Um, apparently, the people thought the last one of the species was just,、uh, I think his name is George,、mm-hmm. um, just passed away recently.、Mm-hmm. But actually, scientists have found DNA evidence of. Um, the giant torsters in different、um, turtles in, on the island. So they believe that the,、um, the ones that were believed to be extinct in,、uh, in 1800、uh, still actually still have traces somewhere on the island.、Mm-hmm. So, also, my focus on、um, the research focuses on the Galapagos archipelago.、Um, and I pay attention particularly to
uh, what happens after human colonization. Mm -hmm. um, as a lot of you might have known, Galapagos, um, people are not supposed to live there. It's that very simple. Um, so what happened after human colonization is that the damage of the original ecosystems um, that caused the extinct of many native species on the island. And one of the big example is the giant tortoises. Mm -hmm. And um, with the import of the goats to the island, um, with all the sailors and pirates that came to the island, and they wanted to make sure that they always have uh, fresh meat to eat, mm -hmm. they introduced goat to the island. And goat um, is a very aggressive species that they can just live anywhere and eat everything. So with the movement of goats and um, it removed uh, the vegetation on the soil of the Galapagos Islands that took hundreds and hundreds of thousand years to form. So uh, in the recent years, um, there was an eradication program implanted to remove the goats from Galapagos Island. So with my work upstairs, um, I also looked at that and, mm -hmm. you know, the the idea of migration of ha animals uh, migrating, moving to a different um, promised land, mm -hmm. or just like us, uh, just like humans. So let's see what else I have here. So uh, running a little bit out of time. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. So I, I guess I'm gonna just flip through the last few slides just to show my installations mm -hmm. um, that I would create created based on my research. <coughs> so this is a, um, a floating village mm -hmm. that I created for Singapore Biennale last year. I worked mm -hmm. with Russell Storer. Um, so with this, I've been studying um, about the prediction, uh, the flood prediction that will take place in Vietnam in 2050 this extreme flood prediction. So with that concern, I created this uh, floating town using vernacular forms of architecture in response to our, um, our ecology, the architectural design movement that led by Pablo Soleri in the 1970s that uh, wanted to create all these hyperstructures. So instead, I wanted to focus on just the vernacular designs of uh, different floating communities in the Mekong and also in Asia, and also farmhouses in Gifu Prefecture in Yamaguchi. Um, just keeping the ar archaeological design principles um, in terms of being archaeological, but at the same time, um, the town I wanted to build would be um, extend horizontally versus the vertical structure that you mm -hmm. usually see mm -hmm. in um, ecology. So okay. anyways, with this, I think I will end my, dis my yes. talk here. Thank you very much. Tiffany. Thanks.